Tonight, a tentative deal done. The agreements with almost half a million public sector workers in Quebec. But the labor disruption still looms large. Salary negotiations aren't settled. And thousands more have no deal at all. We've been seeing a lot of influenza coming in the front doors. The seasonal surge that is swamping emergency rooms. Plus, going the distance to ease the pain of Parkinson's. Also a military maneuver. Israel moves in on central Gaza's refugee camps. And halting the handshake. It's got away from the handshake. Newfoundland and Labrador gets rid of a goodwill gesture. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight, Morella Fernandez. Good evening. The ink is drying tonight on a labor deal in Quebec. The province has signed another tentative agreement with public sector workers. It could help avoid starting the new year with a full general strike. But the deals recently signed don't cover two very key issues, pay and benefits. That could be a problem. CTV's Olivia O'Malley is the latest now from Montreal. Negotiations stretched into the early morning and the last deal was finally reached around 1 a.m. The FTQ says its affiliate representing 1,000 educational professionals on the North Shore is the last of its eight unions to reach a consensus on working conditions. The FTQ is part of the Common Front, made up of four unions representing around 420,000 members. All unions in the Common Front now have deals with the government at the sectoral table. Negotiations on salaries and benefits are still taking place. A Common Front union spokesperson says they will not be giving any interviews until the central Central table is settled. The province has still not reached deals with two other major unions. The FIQ represents about 80,000 healthcare workers, and the FAE represents 66,000 mostly French teachers. Negotiations between the two unions and the government resume Tuesday. The FAE has been on unlimited strike since November 23rd. The Common Front has threatened to join them on the picket line if no deal is reached by the new year. Former Regional Director Marc Granger says the potential agreement on working conditions is a strong signal that bargaining is in its final stages. At this point, that we can say that uh, the next few hours, the next few days at the maximum, uh, we will know where we stand, probably sooner than later. He says things will either go smoothly or all of the province's public schools could be closed come January. Olivia O'Malley, CTV News, Montreal. There have been health care workers on those picket lines, which could help explain why some Quebec ERs are backed up. But wait times are also a problem in other provinces this holiday season. CTV's Kamal Karamali checks in on what doctors are doing to try and keep up. It's the holiday hangover hospitals have been dreading. An overburdened healthcare system pushed even further. Usually in the department, we'd say it's 200, 250 people, but we're seeing three, 350 people. It's like 50% more than normal in the last uh, couple of days. Brought on by a surge of viral illnesses. There's been a lot of influenza. Of course, there's still RSV. Of course, there's still COVID. But we've been seeing a lot of influenza coming in the front doors. In Winnipeg, emergency wait times ranging from 8 to more than 11 hours. Montfort Hospital in Ottawa also seeing a more than 11-hour wait. In Montreal, several hospitals well over capacity, including one more than doubling its occupancy rate. I played shuffle the beds almost all day yesterday to try and find spaces to be able to examine people because we were just waiting for the beds to open up upstairs and there are none. The problem made worse by a lack of family physicians. This Ottawa mother still searching for a family doctor to prescribe her kid's ADHD medication. Our doctors won't prescribe that medication because it's considered a controlled substance. And so we're stuck going into eMERGE and waiting in eMERGE when it's a non-emergency issue. This comes just as new data shows more than 3 million Canadians are stuck waiting for health care services. Nearly 1.5 million waiting for diagnostic care, more than a million need to see a specialist, and 600,000 plus waiting for surgeries. 
the data that government's provided has a lot of holes in it. So we think the true totals were closer to about 5 million people waiting in this country. Meanwhile, health experts are expecting the number of patients at emergency departments to climb even higher with the spread of respiratory viruses set to peak in January. Marilla? All right, Kamal, thanks for that. Israel is once again pivoting, taking its pursuit of Hamas to the central part of Gaza now. Palestinians at refugee camps there describe a night of hell with a near constant barrage of gunfire and explosions. The latest target is the area around Barrage. It's about 10 kilometers south of Gaza City. Authorities say about 250 people have been killed in this latest offensive. It's also forced tens of thousands of Palestinians to try and find other places to shelter from the attacks. CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports. Israel's elite troops are intensifying the ground invasion. All while the Israeli army launched more than 200 rockets, mostly targeting decades-old refugee camps in central Gaza, even releasing this video to demonstrate what it calls targeted strikes on Hamas. We are trying to be as surgical as we can be in a very difficult combat environment. But once again, I stress, we don't want to see uh, civilian casualties. Still in Gaza's largest refugee camp, the wounded and dead are overwhelming aid workers. And the few hospitals left accepting patients in the enclave are in crisis. Across Gaza at the moment, health capacity is at about 20 percent of what it was 80, 80 or so days ago. The devastating toll has hit young Mohammed hard. His mother was killed when a bomb hit their home and his father is missing. So at the age of 13, he's left to care for seven siblings. I don't know how to deal with this, he says, but I know how to make my sister's milk. I change her, but she hardly drinks the milk. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is promising to continue the fight despite mounting international pressure for a pause and escalating tensions with neighboring Arab countries like Lebanon, where Iranian-backed Hezbollah and Israel have almost daily missile strike exchanges. The families of remaining hostages still under Hamas control are pleading for their release. 23-year-old Hirsch Goldberg Poland was seized at a music festival on October 7th. He would have left for a trip around the world today. He's unfortunately not going to be taking off on the trip today, but we are hoping and praying that he's going to take off on this trip soon. The hostages were discussed by top Israeli and American officials in Washington today, where U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken called for a reduction in the war's intensity and an increase in humanitarian aid. Morella? CTV's Kevin Gallagher is in Ottawa tonight. And Washington has approved military aid in another war. The U.S. is providing Ukraine with $250 million in arms and equipment, exhausting available funding for the year. One day after Ukraine destroyed a Russian warship, Russia unleashed an aerial bombardment of almost 50 drones. The attack killed at least five people and left most households in Kherson without power. 4,000 people in Halifax were without power for hours after a reckless joyride involving a 14-year-old driver in a stolen car. A three-hour chase ended when the youth slammed into a power pole and bus shelter. The teen had initially refused to pull over and fled multiple times before police used a spike track to puncture his tires. The minor was arrested and faces several charges. Every day, about 30 Canadians are diagnosed with Parkinson's. It's a disorder that causes tremors and restricts movements. There is no cure. But there are ways to reduce the effect of the symptoms. Exercise helps. Steve Eisman decided to go the distance with his daily workout, and it's proven to be so successful, researchers are now keeping tabs. CTV's medical correspondent, Avis Favreau, reports. Among the some 100,000 Canadians living with Parkinson's disease is 58-year-old Stephen Eisman. Diagnosed a decade ago, he discovered a form of therapy that helped keep his symptoms, like stiffness, brain fog and cramps, largely in check. I think that exercise is the main thing that, that's making the difference. It takes the edge off the symptoms. His hobby has become an eye-opener. For scientists at the University of Guelph, Great job. they tested him before and after a grueling 8,000-kilometer cross-country ride. 
And in this new study, they say this hard exercise didn't worsen Stevens' Parkinson's. It was a form of medicine. He actually got fitter and he got stronger. And probably the most surprising for us was that we saw a reduction in his motor symptom score by almost 50%. Parkinson's patients are generally advised to stick to more gentle exercise because of the risk of falls. But researchers are now midway through another study that suggests Stephen isn't an anomaly. That in those with Parkinson's, more intense or longer bouts of exercise may be the better prescription. The general recommendations that we give to the population probably are not the upper limit to seeing one's benefits. Even Stephen's neurologist is impressed with the powerful effect exercise has had on him. There's been very little progression in terms of his disease. He, of course, is on medication that he requires for Parkinson's, but we've made minimal changes over the past couple of years. I'm trying to get everybody with Parkinson's to at least try getting into a saddle. He's now set up a cycling group to encourage others not to fear their disease. There's also this, this magical thing that happens when you decide that you're not a, a victim anymore. You're not victimized by your, your Parkinson's. And one way you signal that to yourself, to your brain and to your body, is by trying something hard. Fighting his Parkinson's with fitness. Avis Favreau, CTV News, Guelph. Coming up, revisiting a doomed mission. The sentence, we lost com. I think that would be a sentence I would never want to hear in my life again. The catastrophic implosion that overwhelmed the world. For four days this spring, the world was captivated by a terrifying search for five people who disappeared off the coast of Newfoundland. They had boarded a submersible to take a trip down more than 3,800 metres to the ocean floor to see the infamous wreck of the Titanic. They never made it. At number six of our top ten stories of the year, CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver takes a look back at the expedition that ended at a site already marked by tragedy. For 111 years, the Titanic has lived at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, a mysterious resting place fewer than 250 people have ever visited. On June 18th, five people boarded the 21-foot sealed Titan submersible, hoping to descend into that exclusive club of deep-sea adventurers, but they never made it. The sentence, we lost com, I think that would be a sentence I would never want to hear in my life again. An epic voyage to the world's most famous shipwreck. In 2021, Ocean Gate Expedition started offering tourists a chance to visit the Titanic for around $250,000. The Titan was the only submersible able to carry five people to the depths of the Titanic, 3,800 meters below sea level. Turn left, turn right. It was steered by a video game controller and had no GPS. Instead, it relied on text messages from its Canadian support vessel, the Polar Prince, a vessel the Titan lost contact with one hour and 45 minutes into its descent, prompting a search and rescue operation involving Canadian and U.S. authorities. We are deploying all available assets to uh, make sure that uh, uh, we can uh, locate uh, the craft and uh, uh, rescue uh, the, the people on board. But that massive effort was erased against the clock. The vessel only had enough oxygen for 96 hours. Oh, miracles can happen. Um, and we just kept holding out hope. And hope is what millions held on to as they followed the unprecedented search. Finally, on the third day, a piece of optimism. Sonar buoys picked up underwater noises. We don't know what they are, uh, to be frank with you. But the next day, just as the Titan's 96-hour oxygen supply was forecast to run out, the search shifted from rescue to recovery when a remotely operated vehicle reached the sea floor and made a devastating discovery. The debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. The debris brought ashore led to many theories about what happened. While U.S. and Canadian investigations continue, it's believed the Titan imploded under the intense ocean pressure. It's like hitting an eggshell with a hammer, stepping on a can of beer and watching it explode. Something of that nature is what happened. 
Experts believe the tragedy happened quickly, instantly killing OceanGate CEO Stockton Rush, British billionaire Hamish Harding, French explorer Paul-Henri Narglot, Pakistani businessman Shadada Dawood, and his 19-year-old son, Suleiman. Many experts wonder whether the Titan's design, a carbon fiber cabin with titanium ends, was a factor. Nobody had ever made a, a carbon fiber pressure hull for that depth before, and it is very difficult to test uh, and verify. Jay Bloom and his son were supposed to be on that fateful voyage, but pulled out at the last minute, concerned the trip was too risky. I was concerned, um, and as my son was, um, that he was using basically consumer-grade parts for a commercial purpose, and he was doing it in one of the most hostile environments on the planet. OceanGate has now suspended exploration and commercial operations, and though safety concerns have been raised, the company's co-founder says safety was always the CEO's priority. Stockton was one of the most astute risk managers I'd ever met. Uh, he was very risk averse. He was very keenly aware of the risks of operating in the deep ocean environment. And he was very committed to safety. Despite the tragedy and the resources necessary to complete the search, experts believe adventure tourism will continue to thrive. I suspect we will continue to see this, this sort of um, industry grow. There may be calls for more regulation, better understanding of how these sorts of vehicles are designed, built and certified. Among those calling for greater regulation, James Cameron, the filmmaker behind Titanic. Our responsibility as engineers to test, test, test. Don't just guess that it's going to work. The ocean is a very, very unforgiving environment. Andy Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. The world of entertainment has lost one half of the groundbreaking comedy duo Smothers Brothers. When up on the rooftop I heard such a clatter, I sprang to the window and threw up. <laughs> Finish it. What do you mean? Finish, finish it. it. That's all I remember. <laughs> I guess I had too many Tom and Dickies. <laughs> Tom Smothers and his brother Dick brought biting satire to television in the 1960s and used humor to harness social consciousness. The siblings paved the way for late night talk shows. Smothers also made music history with John Lennon and Yoko Ono on their iconic Montreal bed in protest for peace. Tom's mother died at his home in California after a battle with cancer. He was 86. Still ahead, a cherished hockey tradition becomes too hard to handle. Canada be dazzled with a goal scoring display today at the World Junior Hockey Championship in Sweden. Celebrini poked at the Rakoff. Oh, nifty move by Carson Rakoff. Walks right in, scores! Oh, it was a lopsided 10-0 win over Latvia. The Canadians are 2-0 at the tournament. At the end of that game, players shake hands. That simple gesture meant to diffuse the tension from the competition. But in Newfoundland and Labrador, they are trading in that tradition at minor league games. CTV's Garrett Berry explains why. Respect between competitors. In Sweden today, even after a decisive 10-0 Canada win, another round of this hockey tradition, the handshake line. I had a buddy on the other team today, right? It's just, you know, talking to him and talking to them. Um, I think it's good to give your, you know, congratulations to every other player too, right? I think being able to shake their hand and, you know, look them in the eye and just, you know, kind of be in the moment with them. For some diehards, it's not just a simple handshake. It's a laying down of arms. It's a recognition of a battle well fought. Well, I think the handshake line itself is the cornerstone of the game. And it, it, I think it's the respect factor that we pay our opponents, but also the game itself. But Newfoundland and Labrador, these handshakes have become a headache. Blaming post-game altercations, the hockey authority in this province is ditching the tradition. Instead, players will be given the opportunity to tap gloves before the game starts. In a statement, the body's executive director said, including the handshake gesture at the beginning of a game, reduces the potential risk from any heightened animosity that can occur. This surprise change drew a big reaction. 
Not only is the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador speaking out, but Team Canada players at the World Junior Competition in Sweden are talking about the importance of the handshake line. Obviously, there's no friends on the ice, but I think after the game settled, uh, you know, I think it uh, you know, shake your opponent's hand and show some respect. This move has some defenders too. Former pro player Andrew McKim, now a hockey skills coach in St. John's, says it's a small change that makes a lot of sense. I know what's going on. Kids are punching each other's line. Kids are spitting on each other's hands, and it's just it, it's, it's it's got away from the handshake. And before the game, everyone's calm, everyone's ready. Have a good game, let's go, let's get at it. This change is going to start as a trial in the new year, starting with boys' divisions, and officials say it might expand to other areas if the trial is successful. Morella? Thanks, Garrett. After the break, from a Quebec First Nation to Hollywood, a Mi'kmaq artist shoots for the stars. A passion for painting is taking a Quebec woman far from home. She's headed to Hollywood to showcase her work ahead of the Golden Globes. In tonight's Indigenous Circle, CTV Sarah Plowman introduces us to Tracy Metallic, the big dreamer headed to the stars. I wish I could show you everything. Tracy Metallic has learned trust the process, the calmness she feels when she paints, Every zig and zag that's led her from Quebec's Listigouche Mi'kmaq First Nation to Hollywood to showcase her work at an event before the Golden Globes. So I get to go there with all my merchandise that's packed in this SUV and gift it to celebrities. And they're super, super soft. The fact that Metallic was invited hasn't sunk in. Not yet. Too much, there's still too much going on right now. Nine years ago, she didn't call herself an artist. She was a social worker dealing with depression. It all started with my brother passing away in 2013, and then shortly after that, it was just another sibling, another sibling, then my, my parents. Art helped her heal. She gained attention and self-confidence. At one point, Ryan Reynolds shared her work online. Her sights are now set on other stars. I think there's about five actors from the um, Killers of the Flower Moon coming. Um, I'm really hoping, keeping my fingers crossed that Lily Gladstone makes it. I would love to meet her. And um, you know, I have some special items that, I, that I'd like to gift her too. One is this piece called Sisterhood. She is the first uh, indigenous female actress to ever be nominated for a Golden Globe. Those with a front row seat of Metallic's work are proud. It's inspirational sometimes just to watch her. Because this artist may be riding shotgun, but it's her talent that's driving them there. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Woodstock, New Brunswick. That's a wrap on the day. I'm Morella Fernandez. For all of us here at CTV National News, thanks for sharing your time with us. We'll see you again tomorrow.